Yes, I found the ceremony very moving, um, very beautiful, and uh, it was beautifully balanced. And with the, I think the, um, the, the spirit of Dr. Inamori sort of permeated the whole ceremony, which was really very beautiful and very gracious. Yes, I also thought that um, it started in a very exciting way with very uplifting music. Yes. And I walked into the, onto the stadium, uh, the podium rather, and um, found that the music lifted the spirits, uh, got me excited to expect something more. Mm. And uh, there followed a series of uh, components of the ceremony that in total were beautifully balanced, beautifully uh, put together there was the serious and the not so serious, the spiritual and very material. There was the artistic and you might even say scientific elements to the whole of the ceremony. And then uh, at the end of it, uh, there was rousing music that um, gave me the feeling that uh, we were all being sent out to carry on uh, where we were uh, to sustain the philosophy of Dr. Inamori, oh, but also to sustain the work that uh, we had done, and if anything, to do better. Yes, I think it was to enhance what we have done in the right direction, and I, I found it extremely moving, and particularly um, sort of starting from um, the, the traditional old um, Kyoto um, presentations and then ending with the children singing it was very, very moving. You start with the old and then you move forward into the future, which I thought was really very uplifting. Yes, um, there is a concern. The environment has always changed in the past. You can see um, changes in the fossil record and so we know that climate has changed in the past and changed quite drastically. But what is happening today is that the climate um, is changing very fast and it is due to human activity, which is very different from what happened in the past. So, in, so we are concerned and um, we also, because we are the agents of change, we have this responsibility. The concern I have, I alluded to um, in my acceptance speech, is that um, that if that from our own work we have been able to show that um, environments change, and that and so do um, populations change, and the concern is that um, they should be kept in a situation so that they're capable of further change because we know change is going to happen. And when I say that, I have in mind that there is enough genetic variability in organisms to be able to respond to a changing environment. And it's very hard to guess exactly in what way environments will change. There are many theories based on um, a lot of information, but very often these theories can go along different trajectories. So we're never quite sure exactly what the change will be. But what we can be sure about is that um, both environments and populations need to be in a position where they are capable of responding to further change. Creativity is the essence of uh, path-breaking scientific research. And um, I think it comes from within a person to be very curious about the natural world and want to be able to answer questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's not something that can uh, be taught. Um, but I think what uh, teachers can do, and we as teachers uh, can do, is to foster the circumstances where individuals who have that curiosity, that spirit of creativity, uh, to allow that creativity to flourish by asking questions, by being free to ask questions. And also, as teachers, I think we have a role to play in encouraging people to 
um, explore the world with a, a creative spirit to be able to find answers to questions. Yes, and again, as teachers, one of the very effective ways, I think, in teaching and maintaining cre creativity is um, to be, as a teacher, to ask questions of no known answers. So in a discussion group, you will have a discussion around a, a certain question that the students can contribute um, to. And as a, as a professor in a group, it is best to stand back and let the students explore these questions from many different angles. And um, so that's one way of enhancing creativity amongst um, students. And it was a way that I was um, taught in, in one very influential talk uh, um, class in Edinburgh University, which has remained with me for the rest of my life. The other way in doing it, I think, is to... Well, in Princeton University, we have the opportunity, the students have an opportunity to do independent studies. So instead of saying, in my lab, we are doing this, this, and this, and you could slot into a position, um, I would ask them, are you passionate about anything that is in the range of um, behavior, ecology, genetics, or evolution? And if you are, then um, I would love to be your advisor. And by doing that, I've had the most amazing students who have been interested in all sorts of things, from the origin of flight, um, from paleontology, um, and also from somebody who was, um, went for a couple of years and lived with Mayan Indians and was influenced in um, understanding a little bit about their social life and how this changed. And um, so, and to another student I'm thinking of who was interested in a very different topic, which was the effect that um, premature babies that had had operations prematurely had an effect on um, their sensitivity to pain later in life. And she actually did a thesis that was published in a medical journal, even as an undergraduate. But all these people, I don't have the knowledge to, to be able to tell them anything. But what I can do by being older, I can support them, I can have discussions with them, and very often I can tell them, sometimes I can tell them the sources that they could go to, that they could find out more about that. Sometimes I have to help them with permits or something like this in, um, to carry out their work in different places. All these things, by being older, I can support and help them. And I also learn so much from them as well. And we have these very enjoyable discussions once or twice a week for about an hour or two at a time.